Good afternoon, and welcome to today's classic game postmortem on Paperboy. My name is John Solwitz. I am a principal technical director at Electronic Arts. Uh, but today, you will not, in fact, be hearing anything about Paperboy Frostbite or Paperboy Origin. Uh, actually, my credentials to do this presentation have very little to do with electronic arts. Uh, I hope I am qualified to give this presentation because I was part of this really wonderful team, the team that created the original arcade version of Paperboy. In putting this presentation together, I interviewed most of the members of the team, and it is my goal today to share with you our, our shared memories of making Paperboy. And just to be clear, my talk today is mostly going to be about the original version of Paperboy, the one hopefully you played somewhere in some dingy arcade somewhere, one or two quarters at a time. For the purposes of today, I broke up my presentation into the seven parts of the seven days of the week, each part representing a different phase of development of Paperboy. I, I thought this was cute and somehow appropriate. So, without further ado, the story of Paperboy in seven days. On Monday, we go to ideation. I started work at Atari Games in October of 1981 as a microprocessor programmer. I was actually rejected the year previous by postcard, no less, but I was a die-hard arcade game player and even more a die-hard Atari Games player, so I reapplied, somehow got an interview, and miraculously got through that interview. That was the start of my video game career. I ended up working at Atari for about 10 years. For my first assignment, I was paired up with this guy, a designer named Dave Ralston. Dave is actually a designer artist who started his life in, the, in games as a pinball designer for Atari. He started at Atari almost exactly a year before I did. Turns out it was my great fortune and pleasure to work with Dave for the next 18 years. It is rare indeed to find this kind of partnership. I feel very blessed indeed. Dave had been working on this new hybrid pinball video game called Aka R. Aka R, by the way, took its name from Rich Adam, who is the uh, engineer, the, the creator behind Gravatar. Rich had signed a creative document, AKA Rich Adam, Aka R. So we took the name. A little time later, Atari renamed the game Sentinel before we took it on field test. Dave and I worked on that game for around nine months, really tried to get the pinball video thing working, never really did, so we went back to a conventional uh, video game. And off to field tests we went. The game did not last long, the, the test did not go well. We were crushed by this other game, perhaps you've heard of it, Robotron? Uh, thanks Eugene Jarvis. Uh, uh, this once again proved Toyer's Law, named after Dave Toyer, he of Missile Command and Tempest fame, which states, your first game will be a real dog, and ours surely was. Shortly after the short-lived disaster of, of our field test, I think we made around 70 bucks in a week or so, uh, I, I really felt my career was over. And so we conducted a post-mortem, which was uh, typical at the time at Atari. And so going into that meeting, I thought that was about it. But Dan Van Eldren, who was then uh, Vice President of Engineering at Atari Games, instead, instead told us, amazingly, Great try for a bunch of rookies. What are you going to do next? This, by the way, is, in my opinion, is how you start to build a great game team. I want to talk about Atari coin-op for just a second, largely because as I interviewed the other people on our team, a very common thing that they said that was working at, it, that was, working at Atari was either the best job they ever had or one of the best jobs they ever had. And so for me, I'll tell you one of the real reasons it was for me. We worked at one of the few centers of video game making on Earth. 
And the, these games were all made within spitting distance of each other. You could and would regularly walk out of your lab and go into an adjacent lab and play somebody else's game. And these were the games that were in development during Paperboy. This was an incredibly creative atmosphere, and, and you could learn about what it would take for your game to be successful, and frankly, get a little intimidated in the, in the process. I loved it. Back to Paperboy. Around the time of the sun setting of Aka R, Dave presented a few ideas at the Atari Coinot brainstorming. This is February of 1983. The, this brain, particular brainstorming was at Pajaro Dunes, which is near Monterey, California. Dave showed us this idea for a kid riding down the street delivering papers on a single transparency for an overhead projector. PowerPoint was years to come later. Uh, and oh, at the end of his presentation, he flipped the, the, uh, the uh, transparency over and showed us what it would look like for Paperboy to ride down the other side of the street. <laughs> Ironically, of course, he never did. At the end of the presentation, Dave was awarded three attaboys by Atari leadership and won the, uh, the, the, uh, the presentation, the, uh, the brainstorming. I freely admit it took me a while to come around to a game about Paperboy, a game about a kid delivering newspapers. I, after all, was into games like as Asteroids, Battle Zone, Missile Command, anything with a missile or maybe a football in it. So the idea of working on a game about paper delivery was a little strange to me. But Dave kept working on the idea, and sooner or later I came around and came to my senses and joined the team. At Atari, to get a game started officially, you had to survive what was known as an initiation meeting. You would present a thin uh, game description of the game, you know, in our case, you know, Paperboy delivering newspapers, uh, avoiding characters, a, a, some idea of your hardware, and uh, maybe a schedule, things like that. Because Dave had successfully won the previous brainstorming, us getting through the initiation meeting was, in fact, pretty easy. And so, the day after we, get through, we successfully got through our initiation meeting, we began development. So on Tuesday, we go to pre-production. Let's talk about what the Paperboy is made of. First, to do that, I have to talk about the people that made the hardware for Paperboy. The first is Doug Snyder. He was the hardware engineer on the Paperboy hardware. Doug was responsible for the design and the layout of the hardware that was to become Paperboy. It's an interesting thing about working on new hardwares as a software engineer. I am a programmer, after all. You never really know if the bug is hardware or software. And I can remember many times trying to convince Doug Snyder uh, uh, to argue with Doug Snyder about that it was in the hardware. Let me just say I lost most of those arguments. Doug ended up designing most of the hardware that I would eventually use at Atari. Linda Sigovic also joined our team at this time as our, our technician. Linda partnered with Doug to fabricate, debug, and improve the hardware throughout development, basically to keep the hardware alive. A, te a technician back then was about as, just as much of a part of your team as, say, a build engineer is now. Unfortunately, and not to the credit of Atari, uh, Linda was laid off not once but twice during the development of Paperboy. She was, however, absolutely instrumental in the making of the game. At the heart of the Paperboy hardware, leader renamed System 2 was the T11 or Tiny 11. As this is a design-focused uh, presentation, I will not gush on about how cool the, P the, the T11 was. It was basically a PDP-11 on the chip. But I will say, after working on a 6502 for a while, this was awesome. Also, for those who care, the programming language in Paperboy is Bliss, not C. Uh, my guess is that I have personally written more hit games in Bliss than anyone else on Earth. Sadly, that skill set is no longer in demand, and frankly, my knowledge of Bliss is long since gone. Atari was moving away from vector-based games when Paperboy uh, began, so uh, we went to a raster-based game. Uh, using a straight bitmap wouldn't have worked for performance reasons, so we went to a stamp-based hardware. 
The Paperboy or System 2 hardware is a very basic stamp-based hardware on today's standards. Uh, there is a scrolling play field, and on top of that, there are 32 what they used to call motion objects. Now people call, call them sprites. And on top of that, of course, there was a 2-bit alphanumeric layer, all in 8 by 8 uh, pixel uh, stamps. So uh, pretty conventional there. But Paperboy did have something new. Typical raster arcade games at that time were displayed in 320 by 240 pixel resolution, uh, what, call, what was also known as standard resolution. Doug Snyder, our hardware engineer, allowed one of the real big innovations of Paperboy, the use of medium resolution. Basically, he increased the, video circuit, the speed of the video circuitry, and, and in partnership with a company called Wells Gardner, our monitor manufacturer, uh, created a new monitor that could display not 320 by 240, but instead 512 by 384 pixels. I suppose, compared to high definition and certainly to 4K, this is downright quaint. But to us at the time, it was awesome. We knew pretty early on that we did not want to have a conventional controller. Atari Games actually uh, wanted, pressed the teams to do new and original controllers, largely to differentiate the, ga differentiate the games in the arcades. I mean, after all, what is the thing that you notice when you walk up to an arcade game cabinet? You notice the controller. In building our controller, we had the very good luck and fortune to have a guy named Milt Loper join the team as our mechanical engineer. Milt and Dave had previously worked together on pinball, and so they knew each other. Milt is a seriously creative designer engineer who was responsible for the, uh, several of the Atari controllers. Although I think the joystick, the, excuse me, the, the handlebar controllers on Paperboy are his, fi his finest work. Although, of course, he also invented the salad ball controller behind 720, and I think that's pretty cool, too. Of course, Atari had a rich history of controllers well before pa the handlebar controllers on Paperboy. In fact, the Paperboy's controller has a rich ancestry. It went kind of like this, from Battle Zone in 1980, to the Bradley Trainer in, also in 1980. The Bradley, Bradley Trainer was a project that the Atari Games did with the DOT, I, 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 and so part of that was uh, to take the Battlezone controller and turn it into a more of a tank style controller. That controller you can think of being as the stepdad of the Star Wars controller 1983, and the Star Wars controller, think of the stepdad of being uh, the Paperboy controller 1985. In fact, we used, uh, Milt used as a mock-up uh, the Star Wars controller and onto that he bolted a set of red anodized bicycle handles that he, handlebars that he got at a local bike shop, probably a kid's bike shop. But through this controller, we were able to prove that you could in fact control the motion of a kid riding down the street. So it worked. The Paperboy controller went through several iterations. Handlebars, the biggest, the biggest iteration was the ever shrinking width of the handlebars. This was because you could apply an enormous amount of torque on the hand, onto the controller through those handlebars. Uh, at Atari, we had a thing called the Steuben test, named after Dave Steuben, who was the head of engineering at the time. Dave is a big guy. And if your controller could survive Dave, you could manufacture it. Sadly, several of the uh, Paperboy prototype controllers died horrible deaths at the hands of Dave, including one time where Dave actually removed the controller from the cabinet. <laughs> Somehow, Milt was able to, through this process of destruction and reinforcement, build a controller that could eventually survive and was manufactured. The controller had one other problem. Uh, they, 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 it had a problem with buttons. You can't see them if you are slightly shorter, say, the height of a kid. So we would regularly have people coming up to our game and playing it without ever throwing newspapers. This is kind of like Temple Run with bees, and you get fired at the end. This we finally fixed by putting the start buttons on the, control, on, on the controller itself so that at least you had to find the button to start the game. Of course, we needed to build a street. 
Dave and I were both big fans of Zaxxon, which came out in 1982. Uh, Zaxxon is an isometric game. It's, if you haven't seen it, you basically fly a spaceship through essentially a maze. It scrolls from upper right of the screen to lower left in, a, as I say, an isometric perspective. Uh, this was a very early example, maybe the early example of a scrolling isometric game. Uh, but Zaxxon uh, presented us with a bit of a problem because it is in a 60 degree kind of natural isometric perspective, 60, 60, 120, 120, pretty standard drafting isometric perspective. But, this, but the, this gave us a few problems. First, it made scrolling for us more complicated because we were scrolling at odd angle to the playfield hardware, so that meant, just meant drawing was a lot more complicated for us. Also, it meant that we would be showing just about as much of the sides of the houses as we were gonna be of the fronts of the houses, and the sides of the houses are not playable surfaces, so kind of a waste of a lot of real estate there. Uh, finally, uh, the, 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 big, the other problem was that the handlebar controllers were going to be at a pretty strong odd angle with the direction of motion of the kid. So that meant if you push the handlebar controllers forward, the kid was going at a 60 degree angle to them, which felt uh, unnatural. So this is what we did. We crushed the x-axis and brought it down horizontal, parallel to the bottom of the screen, and also, of course, to the top of the screen. Uh, this, this solved a few problems for us. First, the lots now were built parallel to the scrolling playfield, so we could, draw, we could draw this thing row by row. Secondly, papers generally drew, uh, flew horizontally, uh, parallel with the bottom of the screen, which meant aiming, uh, meant aiming was a lot easier. And at least now the controller itself was parallel to the fronts of the houses, and, and the kid was only 45 degrees off angle, uh, so that it felt a lot better. It simplified some other systems too, but those are the big reasons. One of the first things we did, of course, was to build a house. Uh, actually, the first house we built, I think I saw for uh, like three months. Uh, uh, the houses, uh, Dave was able to build houses extremely efficiently. This is a, uh, a lower cost house here. Uh, there are 73 total unique stamps in the base construction of that house. Uh, houses range from around 70 to as expensive as about 135 stamps. Uh, of course, windows, doors, shrubbery, mailboxes, signs, trees, lamps, these were all areas that were placed on top of the base houses in the margin above the scrolling play field. They, of course, were also reused through the neighborhood. Uh, the grass itself was, random, was, uh, was randomized from around eight stamps. That meant that Dave was able to build houses in a, uh, about a 10 by 10 stamp sheet of about 80 pixels to 80 pixels. Pretty efficient. To our world, we added characters. We were also very lucky to have a phenomenal character artist animator join our team. Will Noble was responsible for the development and creation of pretty much every character in the game, including the boy himself. Creating characters at that time out of motion objects was a painfully slow process. You would go from concept sketch work to grid paper, graph paper where you color in pixels to uh, Will sitting over Dave's shoulder, hand entering those, pixel, those pixels pixel by pixel into a thing called the pixel processing system. Those would get transferred to uh, our main VAX using a floppy disk. Well, let's just say that for Will to have created the number of characters that the fidelity and richness that he did speaks to, in that environment speaks to his, his wonderful talent. First thing that Will focused on was, of course, the paperboy himself. The paperboy uh, was went through was not that it looked very much like this early in development. Uh, he was iterated on a bunch of times to improve uh, graphic fidelity, uh, add a bunch of moves. Uh, we did the did color cycling in the spokes, but largely he looked that way. He's a kid on a bike with a basket in front of him. We saw the back of the paper boy for a very long time. It was, it was actually much later that we finally got to see his face. And that was because we finally started doing things like title screens and side panel art for the game. And so we always kind of wondered what he looked like. In the end, I'd like to think that the paper boy takes a bit of a likeness to Albert E. Newman, but that's just me. Our first set of characters in the game were, well, weird. 
uh, they, they uh, remember that most games in those days were pretty damn abstract. But our first vision was not conventional, to say the least. Traffic in the streets included rolling pianos and boats. We had ginormous snails in some of the driveways. And in fact, we also had ducks in business suits. By the way, if you want proof of the kind of creative space, the kind of creative license that leadership gave teams at Atari, this is it. Um, so with a single street and a very weird set of characters and a very basic rule set, we went to focus group. It did not go well. We had built a game that did not resonate with the players because the reality we created well was unreal. Uh, we were, of course, mortified. Uh, but then a couple of very good things happened as two new people joined our team. The first is a guy named Don Trigger. Don joined our team as our product marketing lead. Don's first big task was on Paperboy was, in fact, to run the aforementioned disastrous focus group. And tell, instead of telling us how horribly we had done, we all knew that because we had watched the whole damn thing from behind a one-way glass, he told us about the positive things that the players liked in the game. They liked riding the bike down the street, kind of. And they really liked knocking that one lady that with, the, with the shopping cart over. So those were good things. He made us focus on the positive. As a testament to how bad a focus group it was, at the end of the focus group, one of the focus group participants, a kid, walked up to Don and asked him where he might buy some acid. <laughs> I will talk about Don a little bit more a little bit later. The second guy to join our team at that guy was Brighton Daw. Brighton had been the project lead on a few games up to that point. He was the project lead and lead programmer and mind behind Cloak and Dagger. Atari management, as you can imagine, was, not, was having a hard time seeing the potential of our game, including, by the way, the current project lead of the game. But Brighton liked our game and volunteered to take over as the lead of our project. He was given that assignment and immediately injected positiveness, organization, brainstorming, and just basically a jolt of energy to our team that we very much needed. Brighton stayed with our project for the rest of, of the development of Paperboy. And on Wednesday, we go to pre-production. We needed to rework our game. We needed to rebuild the only street that we had created. But before we did that, we had, the characters had to change. In response to the focus group, we recast the game. We did manage to keep a handful of characters, Death, the Wolfman, and the aforementioned lady with the basket. They all stayed in the game. But we cut all the other characters. Uh, it, it, we, we knew that we did not want to go with a purely conventional cast because, after all, the char average character you see in a neighborhood riding around is neither very exciting nor something that you probably want to throw a newspaper at. But we did, so we kept it a bit strange, and in the end of development of Paperboy, we added about 18 more characters for a total of, uh, of 21 characters in the game, including the bees. Dave was responsible, in addition for, to this, to the uh, creation and art of the six vehicles in the game. Their role, of course, is to keep you out of the streets and to run you over when you go there. Streets needed to be reworked, or one street needed to be reworked as response to this focus group. Up to this point, we had built the street house by house, but this was not going to scale. We, uh, we needed a, a, a different solution. Dave's answer to this was to construct two five-foot-long foam core storyboards and to transfer the line drawings of our inventory of houses at the time to that fo those two foam core sco storyboards. Uh, he did it like kind of like this. And then he put a plastic sheet on top of that so we could draw on them. Onto these two storyboards, we drew all the characters, the obstacles, the paper bundles, uh, the paths of the objects as they went into, in, uh, moved in the, into the world, and triggers, anything that you would interact with on that street. And so it went from this to this, 
and that that course became part of Easy Street. We did this original layout on what, uh, on what would become Easy Street outside on a Sunday Saturday in a marathon creative session in the atrium of the 1501 building, 1501 McCarthy Boulevard, Milpitas, uh, drinking beer. This beer came from the previous night's beer bash uh, at Atari. Both Dave and I remember this as being one of the great creative days of our careers. In a sense, the muse came to us with a keg. This became our blueprint for construction for our first street. We did have a bit of a problem. We wanted to take score away from the, play, from the player for breaking the windows on, on his customers. At the time, you could not lose customers. You could only t smash their windows. But back then, in the arcades, and probably true now, you just don't take score away from players. So Lyle Raines, who was the creative director of Atari, who is one of the minds behind Asteroids, of course, came up with the idea of separating out damage bonus, breakage bonus, from the core score so we could take score away from the player and get away with it. I think it worked. So we, with a newly cast uh, first road, a fully laid out first road, and a somewhat improved scoring system. We went to our second focus group, and it generally went well. We got out of our focus group what we needed to get into production, confidence that we were confident that we were building the right game. And so, on Thursday, we go to production. We went to production with key takeaways. We needed more depth in our game. We only had one road. Paper delivery needed to be a whole lot more interesting and more important, and the sounds needed a lot of work. So we used the same techn construction techniques we had on the first street uh, to build two streets. But before that, we gave our first street its name, Easy Street. It had been unnamed at this, uh, to that point. And to that, we added Middle Road and Hard Way. But, as with all games in those days, we had a problem. ROMs were expensive, and we were at running out of space. I suppose that's true of games today, too. The good news is that Paperboy is largely a patterned learning game, so giving the players familiarity by seeing some of the same house designs in the game was really not a bad thing. So we ended up leveraging our base house design significantly. This house here, which is of course the first house you see in the, in the street, in, in the, of Easy Street, is in the game six times. This here uh, house at 116 Easy Street, about halfway down the first block, you see also about six times. In fact, in Paperboy, there are 60 total street addresses made of 11 base house designs and nine cross streets made out of one base cross street. So we were able to fit the thing in ROM. A popular idea at the focus groups was the idea of a training course. Now, of course, a, the training course in Paperboy is essentially a bonus round. Paperboy was not the game that invented bonus rounds. But it, it, uh, it was a break in the action for us and a way to bring in new game mechanics. Our first idea here, by the way, was to have a field uh, covered in windows and mailboxes. But uh, we landed on a more pinball-style theme with knockdown targets, that sort of thing. I don't think Dave was every ha very, very happy with the, the bonus round of the, uh, the training course. He wanted uh, much more dynamic elements, moving targets, that sort of thing. And he wanted the, the training course to uh, progress uh, day to day based on the actions, your previous actions from the previous day. But I think it worked, and I think, and I think it changes the rhythm of the game. I think arriving at the end of the street to a grandstand gives a little bit of magical surprise. Paperboy is really, of course, three games in run. One, it, the three streets are completely independent. Um, in fact, we were even considering for a while, a bit too late, releasing Paperboy in three independent episodes. Uh, but because we released it all as a single game, we needed to tie those three streets together and reward a high score for the player who did the best on the accumulated score of all three. We call this our Grand Slam high score table. The Grand Slam system and much more was written by a guy named Bob Flanagan. 
Bob Flanagan was and is an outstanding game programmer. Bob started at Atari on Paperboy, but then is the only programmer to work on not only Paperboy, but Marble Madness, Gauntlet 1, and Gauntlet 2. Also, I should say, Bob and I are both uh, empl currently employed at Electronic Arts, and we count three more alumni of Atari at, an EA, at EA for a total of five. The map screen we needed to add because we had given the player at this time the ability to lose and then gain back uh, customers. I think the map screen has to be one of the earliest examples of a metagame, certainly in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the arcades. You were on a very basic level managing an economy. That gave you a bit of a break of an action. But here's what I really think. Real paper boys, if you remember them, would, would start each day by getting a bundle of newspapers, like you see in the game, cutting them open, and then rolling each newspaper, newspaper by newspaper, taking a rubber band, putting it over those rolls, and taking those papers and putting them in their bags as they go out on their day. For me, I think the map screen is a metaphor for this because it prepares you for your next day. So it is our homage to real paper boys. As a byproduct of these game systems, we gave the player a choice between good and, well, evil. We, didn't, we never really did think of the boy as a hooligan, but you did have a choice. You could spend your game trashing every house on the street and just save one, or you could focus on being the best paper deliverer possible, or, but of course, the, uh, to get the best score, you needed to do both. But I think this player choice, this trade-off, kind of works. Baba! Junior, my lovely younger boy, I am so sorry to have to leave you. Oh, Baba! But you must carry on in my work. I'm just a boy. No, shh, 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 shh. You are the paper boy. You must remember to deliver only to customers, not the non-customers. If they are not your customer, break their window. Remember, death comes on a Tuesday. Thank you, Shadowcast Pictures and Freak Films. I have left for last, of course, the incredible soundtrack of Paperboy. After all, didn't we always leave sounds to the end? We had two key people on audio, both with the title sound designer. On the left, you will see a man named Hal Cannon. Hal Cannon was responsible for the excellent Paperboy music, the soundtrack, um, uh, the score. Uh, Hal also composed the music for Marble Madness, Gauntlet, 720, and a bunch of other games at Atari. Hal mysteriously left Atari somewhere in the mid to late 80s and basically was never seen again. He's the only person of the original team I did not interview for this presentation. I hear rumors that he's in Lake Tahoe, I just don't know. Earl Vickers joined our team as the lead sound designer and our, and our main contact into the audio group. He is responsible for the, uh, the, all the sounds and, and, and the voice in the game. He has not disappeared. He is still active in the Atari community. Earl Vickers was instrumental in the addition and usage of the Yamaha YM2151FM synthesis music chip. Wiki says it was the first Yamaha single chip FM they ever produced. Earl just thought of it as freaking magic. Added to this was a very cool speech synthesizer from Texas Instruments. Speech was being added to pinball at the time, so it was natural that it would come to video. Earl Vickers composed most of the lines of dialogue you hear in the game. Earl also conducted the auditions within Atari for the voice talent we used. Uh, for, we, of course, did not pay professional voice talent. Uh, for the narrator, he chose a fellow game programmer named Peter Thompson. 
for the, in the narrator, we were thinking we wanted to cover the, and dramatize the uh, character. We wanted to over dramatize the character of the kid to give the the kid a, a gravitas not associated with paper delivery specialists to create a hero or perhaps an anti-hero. The voice of the paper boy was done by none other than our, our product marketing manager, Don Traeger. By the way, a bit later, Don helped to start the whole electronic arts sports business, among other things. But I think him doing the voice of the paper boy was his finest, finest work. <laughs> Years later, Don was at a trade show working for electronic arts. He walked up to a, a, mid, a Bally Midway booth and where they were demonstrating a sequel to Paperboy. Uh, the, the booth uh, guy demonstrating the game showed him the game and then at the end of the demonstration looked at Don and said, Sir, are you familiar with Paperboy? To which Don said, Sir, I am the Paperboy. <laughs> and walked away. The paper boy's lines themselves are split into basically three categories, uh, the first of which was as a response to dying. These were pretty much, uh, pretty easy hooks to put in because after all we knew when they were dying or get, he's running into something, you hear them clearly because that's a good moment of the game. The second set of lines, the next category was as a reward for putting uh, newspapers directly into a mailbox. Again, simple hooks for me to put in. Uh, again, a very nice moment in the game and, and, easy, and easy to recognize. The third set of, of, of lines, I think, were, well, the most interesting. Uh, they were basically the kids' observations on the characters in the game. Uh, these are, this is uh, basically a commentary as delivered from the paperboy's perspective. Uh, we were trying to anticipate what the player was thinking as they played the game and then give it a voice. Uh, sadly, uh, mostly because these, these cues stepped on other audio and the complexity of just figuring out when a character was on the screen, a lot of these cues never made it. Uh, mostly because in the end we ran out of time. Not too surprisingly, we crunched to get the boy ready for test. I myself worked something like eight weeks of seven days a week in the lab. I want to take a moment now and pause and, thank, and I'd like to thank my wife Donna for putting up with me during this time. She was my girlfriend at the time. Uh, without her doing that, I just would not have made it. But in the end, us putting this game together was a labor of love. One thing happened as we got close to field test. People came into our lab and started playing our game. At Atari, you knew you had a good game when at lunch, people would come in and play your game. After all, it was the only place that you could play this game in that lab. Uh, and, and so we spent the weeks and months getting ready for field test, watching people play our game, playing our game ourselves, and iterating on it. And in the end, I think it prepared us pretty well for field test. And so on Friday, we go to field test. The first field test was conducted at Golfland Sunnyvale. Uh, Atari did a lot of, this is on El Camino for those of you who know it. Uh, Atari did a lot of testing uh, at uh, field testing at Golfland. It was close to where we were. It was a big arcade. We knew our competition was there and frankly they knew we were there. Linda Sinkovic, our, uh, our technician, was responsible for the care and feeding of our, of our game and the arcade. So one of the core things she would do, for example, would be to change ROMs as we did iterations. She remembers quite fondly putting a bunch of credits in the game for the kids that were waiting in line behind her as she did that. Due to the success of Marble Madness largely uh, and of System 1, uh, Atari rebranded the Paperboy hardware at this time to System 2. Uh, the, the, change, the biggest change to the hardware was the splitting off of a separatable uh, ROM board, which is you see on uh, the right there. Um, uh, it's so you could do a ROM change without changing the whole cabinet. The other biggest change was taking our very cool three-box cabinet and turning it into a more generic one-box cabinet and removing our very cool side panel art. Oh well. 
720, Accelerator, APB, Super Sprint are, amongst, are among some of the games that got built on System 2, but I think largely they were all built as whole games and not as, uh, as ROM changes. Field test, for, field test for Paperboy lasted for about four months. Uh, we spent that time watching uh, people play and doing iterations. We collected data, game, games even then recorded and aggregated player statistics, and iterated. We talked to players, uh, you could do that then, as they played the game. Uh, Paperboy earned well and consistently didn't break any records, but it held its earnings over a four-month period such that at the end of that period, we were able to convince, or maybe the earnings were able to convince, Atari uh, leadership to build our game. And then, of course, at that point, it became Atari's game. So, on Saturday, we go to manufacturing. Paperboy was first shown at the Amusement Machine Operators Association show, AMOA, in Chicago in the fall of 1984. It was shown alongside of Marble Madness, but not sold then. Marble Madness was. Paperboy was first sold at the Amusement Showcase International show, ASI show, in the spring of 1985, and manufacturing would have begun right about then. Here are some pictures of Paperboy on the manufacturing line. In the upper left corner, you will see Dave Rostin playing the game on the line. In the lower right corner, you will see a row of Paperboys on the line. I cannot tell you how ridiculously wonderful and singular experience it is as a game maker to see your game on a manufacturing line. In the upper right hand corner, you will see a somewhat redacted picture of the Paperboy launch party. This was an all day, all night affair. Atari marketed the game as usual, although there were a couple things that were a bit different. Uh, they, you know, typically, they would sell games through sell sheets and print ads, and that was about the same. But one thing that was different was that Dave and I were lucky enough to actually be featured in some of these print ads. Uh, the, I'm not sure that Dave and I were the first featured in print ads, but we were pretty early. Uh, this, you have to keep in mind that in a few years previous to this, Atari did not even allow credit screens in its games. Uh, the games kind of made themselves, so this was a pretty de a big deal, and, and I think Dave and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Another thing was that Atari, in the summer of 1985, conducted a uh, world's greatest paperboy competition, complete with a fake neighborhood, uh, summer 85. And in the end, around 3,000 units, 3,500 units were produced and sold for about 2,500 bucks each. We were all hoping for maybe more than 5,000 units, but this was paperboy, but the paperboy was expensive. And well, it was 1985 in the arcades. And now about the Nintendo Entertainment System. In every reasonable, independent, quantifiable measure, the System 2 crushes the NES. It has more bits, it has more speed, it has more pixels, it has more RAM, it has more ROM. Hell, we had a custom controller, a beautiful medium resolution monitor, speakers and everything. Every single metric except one. As I mentioned, the Paperboy Arcade sold about 3,500 units in the spring of 1985. Three years later, Mindscape ported Paperboy to the NES and to manage to sell, oh well, two million copies. <laughs> Obviously, we were all very glad of this. We were very excited, frankly, quite blown away. It took me personally years and years, though, after this to, to ever realize that the days of the arcades were numbered. Paperboy derivatives have been published on lots of platforms, both as faithful ports and, and true sequels, but I think, unless your game has been ported as an LCD video game, <laughs> you have not really made it. And so now we come to the true postmortem. Uh, I'm not here to bury Paperboy. Never mind. So uh, on Sunday, the papers are heavier. 
So in terms of a true postmortem, first we have to talk about what we wish we had had less of. This was a less than wonderful day, the day that we learned we were being sued. Um, I le we learned this, by the way, first in the press. Uh, two kids claimed that they had sent to Atari the idea for Paperboy. Now, we knew that Dave had shown us the concept for Paperboy well in advance of when they even claimed to have sent it to us. Um, and, 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 and Atari was incredibly supportive in this, but it still hurt. I myself learned about this waking up one morning and hearing a news anchor on my radio tell me about it. This was just kind of interesting. In December of 1985, we were informed that folks at the CPSC were concerned that perhaps we were teaching bad bicycle riding habits. <laughs> you know, riding down the wrong side of the street into traffic. Actually, if you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, almost exactly a year ago, the Daily Show, Trevor Noah, did a thing about uh, uh, guns and g games teaching guns, and he actually used Paperboy as a reference for how kids don't actually learn how to smash all the windows on the street through games. So I recommend it if you're interested. And in terms of what every programmer wants less of, bugs. So, if you see the newspaper going behind the back of the paper boy, it is not in fact a wraparound Steph Curry throw, it is in fact an ordering problem between the papers and the paper boy. Similarly, if you see the paper boy riding through solid objects, this is in fact a priority problem between the, uh, the paper boy and the planter that should be behind him. Here's a, this is a great bug. I learned about this bug two weeks ago <laughs> doing the for this presentation. So you see on the screen two different houses with, uh, with this uh, on the screen. What's interesting about it is, well, they both have the same address. The house on the left is properly numbered 111 Easy Street. It is the last house on the first block of Easy Street. The house on the right should be numbered 110 Easy Street. Uh, it is the first house on the second block of Easy Street. Turns out if you get hit crossing the road between these two houses, it screws up the addresses of every single house on the second block. But days after manufacturing, the day after manufacturing began, and weeks and weeks after the ROMs were burned, we heard about this rather amazing bug. For those of you who have not heard of this bug, uh, I will describe it to you. At the end of each round, of course, there, at the, right in front of the grand, slam, grand stand, there is a yellow line. You ride your bike up to the line, the game ends for that round. But instead, if you feel so inclined, uh, you may take a hard right turn at the end there and cut into that grass area. Uh, it turns out if you do that, well, you ride forever. <laughs> um, and you get millions of points in this kind of surreal stamp play field. As I mentioned, I learned about this literally the day of manufacturing began. I learned about this and those cabinets were on the manufacturing line. I was, of course, somewhat panicked. But it turns out this was a mode problem, of course, because you're skipping the trigger line that's under that line by doing that little cut. Uh, and, but what's really more interesting and uh, pretty, pretty neat, I think, is that the fix to this bug was two bytes. In fact, it was really four bits. This was, an in, this was basically changing a constant 77 to a two and a branch equal to a branch not equal. That impacted one and only one ROM, which saved my life. Uh, in fact, this was the only ROM change that Atari ever did for Paperboy. And, uh, and, and, and I, I think you can still see this bug if you'd like to in the arcades. It's, I know it's, uh, it's available on YouTube. And in terms of things that I, I wish there were more of, well, first this. Dave had always wanted indirect shots. He wanted the ability to kick things off of an obstacle and, and break a second win, uh, uh, story window. In fact, lots of the houses in our game had uh, fully functional windows that could have been broken if I could ever have gotten the newspaper there. But unfortunately, this really screwed up the collision system, so we never really did it. 
uh, in fact, lots of targets up there and never got reached. Um, this, this, was, this house was the poster child for that one. We always wanted to knock over the, uh, the uh, 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 potted plant at the top of that house. As you may have noticed in this presentation, there are initials of several of the team members hidden in the, the, uh, the vehicles of the game. Dave's initials are hidden in the construction sign in front of the, uh, the dirt jump ramp. Dave may argue with me on this one, but to me, it is not a random uh, fact that the hat color of player one is orange, is orange, and the second player is blue. Orange for player one, blue for player two. At Atari, Major League Baseball was a really big thing. I myself am a diehard Giants fan. Dave was a diehard Dodger fan. Orange for player one, blue for player two. I'm just saying. In terms of things that I really wish there was much more, our team stayed together for a while. Dave and I would not leave Atari uh, for another six years, and in that time, we managed to build th three other games in that time. But in terms of things that I wish there were much more, the joy of writing Paper, paper Boy, the incredible creative freedom and license that Atari Games gave us in doing that. The, the, the fact that I was the first person to ever see anything in Paperboy, I do remember that. This was not my only time at the rodeo. I, I've, I've, I've launched and shipped plenty of the games since then, but it was, it was my first. Over the years, I've heard the stories of people who played Paperboy. I've heard people say, hey, I just played your game in the lab. Hey, I played, hey man, this game is cool. When will it come out? Hey, I played Paperboy in the bowling alley the other day. I remember that I used to play Paperboy as a kid. My son and I play Paperboy together. He really likes it. It's pretty cool, really. I hope you have had some joy in playing Paperboy 2. And that's Paperboy in seven days. I hope I will be able to answer some questions in a second, but I wanted to leave you with this from Random Encounters. Well, watch out, she looks pretty mad. I'm on a walk with Junior, like any other day. I'm not sure how it happened, but the baby's rolled away. I positively panicked, but it happened last week too. Plus, I'm just the babysitter, losing children's what I do. Baby's rolling down Easy Street. Oh, that baby. I'm trying to get my pants on, but they're really freaking tight. Why I'm in the street, I haven't got a clue. She's a shopaholic hag. Hey, come on, make it snappy. This ain't no deja vu. I rob you almost daily because Robin's what I do. I don't get all this fuss. I'm just a normal guy who takes his normal walks and collects souls when people die. I'd love to read the bodies on the entertainment news. Thank you. I'm not that weird. It's just a thing I do. I think we have a few minutes for questions, if anybody's got any. I have five minutes for questions, if anybody's got any. No questions? 
Hello? Hi. Hi. Uh, fantastic talk. Really loved your, you know, the whole process and hearing the story about it. I was curious, after the release of the original Paperboard, did you have any, like, hand or work or influence on the derivatives or, like, Paperboard 2 that came out years later? Not, not at, uh, Dave had some. I had none. Uh, Atari, Atari, you did not do sequels at all. Imagine, a, I work for Electronic Arts now, so this is... <laughs> so, the, uh, so at Atari, they actually told you not... You know, I, so Dave and I immediately started focusing on 720, and that became my life at that point. Um, and, uh, and, and then Atari added Tengen to do, at, to do derivatives, and at that point we got more involved, uh, but not, not a lot. Those games were really driven independently. Thanks. Of course. I just noticed when you were showing all the different vehicles with the associated people, the one with the motorcycle, the initials didn't seem to match. <laughs> What's the story behind that? Uh, what a, oh my God, I can't believe that's a question. So, uh, uh, so that's Milt Loper, uh, that's CR on there. Uh, uh, um, so I just talked to Milty about that for a while, really trying to get it. So he, I don't think I'm getting it away. So uh, he, uh, he was pretty heavy duty motorcycle gang kind of guy before he worked at Atari. And the best he told me was CR stands for crazy rooster. I, that's all I got on that one. Right. Thank you. I don't think it stands for that, by the way. <laughs> Anything else? I was a paper boy when it came out, and I loved this game as a kid. Um, I could never get more than about halfway through, though, so my question is, can you beat it? Can I beat the game? Yeah. Uh, I can get through, these days, hell no. Uh, back then, um, uh, yeah, I could get through most of the game. Uh, hard way, it's a little hard for me. Uh, Dave is an awesome player. Um, yeah, I've, I've never been the greatest player on earth, but yeah, uh, I, could, I did okay. Uh, there's great videos of people who are really good at the game, of course, and that's, that's pretty, pretty spectacular for me to watch. All right, so I'll throw two quick ones at you. Yeah. So. I, you cracked me up with the comparison of hardware on the Nintendo, but I'm probably, in fact, a show of hands, who played the Nintendo version? Yeah, that's probably most of us. I never yeah, actually wait, got wait, to see who the Who played the arcade version? My God. All right, so 50-50. Hey, that's pretty good. But nevertheless, did you guys have any hand in the Nintendo port at all? Did they at least consult you or anything, or just kind of popped out? To my recollection, it was magic. It, in fact, I... Look, so the, the byline at Atari Games, the one I worked at was uh, coin op the real Atari. Mm -hmm. To say we were looking down on the home was, that's an understatement. Uh, so uh, we were, we were uh, privileged kids working on these incredible hardwares. Uh, so no, I really didn't. I, I, I think I, I, it would be dishonest if I said I did. No, that's fine. They it, did it, an incredible job on that game. No, I, I, honestly, that's what I grew up liking. And then the other one is literally on my Nintendo Switch over there, there's a game called The Video Kid. Are you familiar with this game? I, I am not. Anybody in here familiar with The Video Kid? So a couple people, it's basically 80s nostalgia on Paperboy. Oh, excellent. So, so the fact that, and you didn't even know it existed, right? So I'll have to show it to you at the end because I got my Switch. But I mean, how does that feel that you're still literally influencing games and styles and it's, you know, I'm sure there's mobile games and all these things yeah, based on this design? So it was that story I told at the end and that very much is, I don't, I don't make it through, uh, you know, I've been in the business a few years now and I don't make it through a year without walking at some meeting and some, it's typically an executive who's been playing my game when they were a kid, saying, well, here's John Saul. It's, yeah, yes, he's the technical director on this project, but what he really did, he worked on Paperboy <laughs> back in the 80s. I love it. Isn't that exciting? Cool, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> did Atari have any guidelines as far as like average gameplay per quarter? Yeah, uh, yeah, you were trying, so everything was about, um, uh, yeah, you want to about 30 to 90 seconds per, per uh, credit. Paperboy actually came out at 50 cents a play. Uh, um, somewhere in there, and there were, and what was really interesting is some of the stuff that I actually cut from the presentation was, one of the things was that you knew you had to hook the player in 30 seconds. And the positive thing that that did for the team, it, it focused the whole team on core gameplay. I'm sure a lot of us have been on game teams where they don't focus on gameplay, they focus on everything around gameplay, but if you gotta grab somebody in 30 seconds, it, made, it, it focused you. Um, and so the, guideline, the idea was that if you didn't get the player within 30 seconds, they'd walk away. 
Uh, so in terms of earnings, somewhere, if I, as I recall, a couple other people will probably give you, you know better, so 30 to 90 seconds, somewhere in there, is what you kind of want to turn over rate. Oh, God. That's Franz Lanziger. Hello. Thank you, thank you so much for this trip down memory lane for me. That was quite an experience. I had the privilege of working with John at Atari for a couple of years. Um, when you mentioned Bliss, I thought, oh my god, I had totally forgotten about Bliss. So uh, I used 6502 on Crystal Castles, but then I worked on Gremlins, which never made it out the door, uh, in Bliss. So I qualify my thing by successfully shipping. I just wanted, to, yeah. <laughs> so I, my, my, I do have a question. What what other projects did you use Bliss on? Seven. It was 720. That was uh, it. 720, and then you moved on to C, probably, or yep. C plus plus. Yep. C. Yeah. Space T. Yeah. So Bliss, for those of you, no, I bet nobody knows what Bliss is. It was a high-level language, sort of like C. <laughs> it sort of looked like C. Right. You could actually do if-then-elses and loops. And the processor underneath was something entirely new with six, uh, 16, you know, 16 bits all of a sudden, right. not 8 bits. So That's right. very, very exciting. Yes. Right. Anyway, thank you so much. Of course.